Our next panel is really exciting. It's a group of tech executives, a teacher, some of you know Waj, Esther Wojcicki from Pali, great award-winning journalism teacher, and a student. I'm not going to introduce the panelists, but I am going to introduce the moderator, a good friend of mine, Stephen Balcom, who for the past 30 years has had a number of important jobs in the nonprofit sector and is really one, one of the pioneers of internet safety, having developed content rating systems both in the UK and the US. And his latest venture, which he's, well, it's not really a venture, his latest organization, which he founded a number of years ago, is the Family Online Safety Institute. He is the founder and CEO, and Family Online Safety Institute, or FOSI as we call it, is one of the leading internet safety organizations and the leading organization when it comes to convening and bringing people together. We bring kids together on Safer Internet Day. He brings the leaders of the technology industry and the safety folks and government folks, sometimes very high-ranking government people, to Washington, D.C. every year for a really important conference. Maybe someday some of you can get a chance to go to the FOSI annual conference, but it's a really amazing event, and he does a lot of work, and he and I serve on safety advisory boards at Google, Facebook, and TikTok, and a number of other companies, Snapchat. Uh, so he's a great leader in this field, and... Uh, a perfect person to moderate the panel. So Stephen, come on up. Thanks, Nick. Cheers. Thank you so much for that, Larry. Really appreciate it. and a big fan of, uh, of your work in Connect Safely. How are you guys doing? Let's, let's try that again. How are you guys doing? That's what I wanted to hear. Fantastic. All right. So we have a a big, big panel and some really, really interesting folks up here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I think it's far better if you hear from them directly. Uh, and we've got a slightly different uh, way in which we're going to do this because um, Michaela, who you're going to meet in a moment, is going to help me with the questions. And I know that she's also received some questions from you guys. And we're also going to come out to you for questions later on in the panel. So why don't we start at the very end? Karuna. Thank you, Stephen. Can everyone hear me? Hey, hi everyone. My name is Karana Nen. I head out our global safety policy efforts at Facebook. So I'm not too far away in Menlo Park. And I've been at Facebook seven years. Um, I think some of you may be wondering what does safety policy really mean? What do we do? So part of our job is making sure that we are working across the company, across teams that really build our products, who set our policies, to make sure that we are thinking of safety 360 degree and designing a very safe experience uh, on our platforms. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Jeff Collins. I'm the head of trust and safety at TikTok. You made it a little easy for me describing what we do. Um, I've spent more than 20 years in the public arena um, working on education and policy matters, and that includes time at the White House, the Diplomatic Corps, Chevron, After School App, and now at TikTok. Really excited to be here, to learn from you guys, to share a little bit of what I've learned over the years, and then to interact with you guys with your questions. Thanks. Hi, I'm Alicia Blumroth. I am the public policy lead for kids and families at Google, which also includes YouTube. Um, and Karuna said a little bit about what, pub, um, what policy is. Public policy is also how we work with NGOs like Stephen and Larry and with government and with all kinds of people sort of in the outside world, experts in the space to kind of learn about um, how we should change our policies, how we should design our products, and really kind of giving that bridge between Google and the outside world. And I am pretty new to Google. I've only been at Google about a year and a half. And before that, I taught at a university. So I taught media and communication studies. And so I've done a lot of work with young people, with children, with families, kind of learning about what you guys uh, like to do online, don't like about your time online. So I'm really excited to hear more from you today. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Leslie Boggs. I am the president for National PTA. Our association is made up of over three and a half million members, which all of you sitting here today, young people, you could be a part of our association and really find the power of your voice. We are the, the ones, we are the largest um, child advocacy association in our nation. And so we really look for programs and initiatives that really impact our families and students across the nation. So it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Esther Wojcicki, uh, nickname is Waj. 
I'm the founder of the Palo Alto High School Media Arts Program, and um, which is now the largest media arts program in the nation. And uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to say we have a representative here soon uh, to talk to you about it. I've been teaching for 38 years, um, probably older than some of your parents. <laughs> and my goal is to empower students and help them to be the best they can be. And I use journalism as a tool to do that. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm from Palo Alto High School, and uh, I'm <laughs> and I'm editor of uh, Palo Alto High School Social Activism Magazine, Anthro, which is both an online and print magazine that tries to analyze the uh, social situations in both like our community, the Bay Area, and also internationally. Fantastic. And you and I are going to work together on. Uh, asking these guys some really interesting questions, both that we've come up with, but also some of you guys have come up with as well. So the title of this is, How Can Stakeholders Promote a Climate of Civility and Safety? And that's kind of a geeky, kind of policy wonky kind of a way of saying, how can we all work together? Um, it's important to know that you know, in a democracy like we have in the, in the US, um, it's not gonna be one separate part of the, of the society that's going to impose a particular way of doing things. We don't have uh, one way of, of creating safety. It really is going to evolve and involve what I would describe as a culture of responsibility. So governments, industry, law enforcement, parents, teachers, and the kids themselves all have different but overlapping areas of responsibility uh, for safety, and for trust and civility. So I don't know, we'll start with you, Karuna, and we'll work our way down. Let's, let's do the 35,000 foot level question. How can, and by the way, what is a stakeholder? How can stakeholders promote safety and civility online? So I think, Stephen, you answered a part of that question. Each and every one of us has a role to play in this. So it starts with you know families, making sure that there's a safe space for parents and young people to have conversations about what they're doing online, uh, which apps are they using, what do those apps really take from you in terms of data, but what also do they give back to you? Why are you on them? What's the value of being online? But also tech companies like ours have a really important to play in this conversation. Uh, when you look at Facebook, we are a family of apps which includes apps like Instagram. How many of you are on Instagram? Okay. I hope you're all above 13. Uh, how many of you are on Facebook? Okay, WhatsApp? Okay, um, and has anyone used Oculus? A VR device, okay. So we have so many different apps that companies like ours put out there, and we have such an important role in making sure that when we are building new technology, we're making it really clear to people on what these technologies are, what, the, you know, what our policies are, what can people do and not do on them, but also what are the mechanisms they have to do things like reporting or to block someone who they don't want to interact with on our platform. And the way that we want to think about it is we want to make sure that you have trust in our platforms and our services, and this is true for all of industry, uh, give people transparency, you know, making sure that you know what data you're sharing and what you're doing on our services, but also the control of, on your experiences on our platforms. So when it comes to you know, us as industry thinking of ourselves as stakeholders, we really do think we have a huge responsibility to play here, not just in building safe experiences, but working with you all. So you know, having programs that we can take out to inform you about our platforms and what our rules and what our policies, but also with your parents sometimes. So we have a parents portal where parents can go and find out information about our family of apps. So. That was a really long, wide-ended way of saying that I think everyone has a role to play. Industry, we think we have a really important role to play in this as well. Great, thanks. I'll just pick up there. I think that, um, I think you hit it on the head in saying that there's not one solution or one person. There's a lot of things we have to do together externally. And I think I'll give a little bit of an overview of how we look at safety and positivity at TikTok. Um, because we are one of the stakeholders in this discussion. So TikTok's mission is to inspire creativity and bring joy, and to do that, we need to have a positive and safe app. Um, there is not one thing we do in our company or in our app, we take a multi-pronged approach. And I'll just describe that briefly. So first, we start with our community guidelines and our policies. 
And those are things that people often overlook, but I think it's important for you to take a look. They really show the values of the company and the app, and they help set the tone for the app. The next thing we have are um, tools that you can use, and we'll go into more detail on this later, but we really try to provide tools that our users um, can use to create the environment they want in the app. Um, the next thing we have are uh, procedures that we use to make sure things are safe, to keep things off the app when they should be off the app. And then finally, something I'm really proud of, uh, my colleagues have done amazing work here, is education. Um, we look at education in a lot of different ways. We try to educate in the app through our safety videos, um, through our safety center, through our safety blog, um, and then outside of the app. And I think the best example of that is being here, working with FOSI, working with Connect Safely, and um, discussing some of these challenges with you and, and the users of our app. So that, that's just a little bit of an overview about uh, of how we as a stakeholder look at this. Great, thanks. Alicia? So who in this room has heard of something called the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Anyone? The UN Convention, one person? Okay, so there's an international convention called the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I would really encourage you guys all to look it out. And in that convention, it says that children, and that includes teenagers, everyone up to 18, have the right to be both protected and the right to express yourselves on issues that are important to you, to participate in the world around you, to learn, to play, to enjoy kind of the whole kind of world around you, and that includes the world online. So when we think about how our company has a responsibility both to put in place protections, but also to kind of give access to great things and great opportunities. So what I would say our sort of inspire, or our inspiration there really is to think about how everything we build and do can kind of do both of those things, right? Put in place safety protections, but also give access to great opportunities. So there's three things that we do to do that. One is build products. So products like um, Google's Family Link, for example, gives a way for families to kind of have supervised experiences so that children can have great experiences, but also have protections in place. We put in place policies that sit behind every single one of our products, and all of those products are very different, right? Google Search is really different from YouTube, is really different from Play, and each of those places have policies in place that do put in place certain kinds of protections, right? Protections from illegal content, um, but also in some cases protection, so for example on YouTube, um, we have new policies around harassment and hate speech to better protect um, the people on our platform at the same time is given opportunity to express and to participate. And then finally, through education and outreach, right? So wanting to work with educators, with young people to make sure that we're, you know, giving access to fun, engaging, inspiring educational programs like Be Internet Awesome so that young people are able not just to keep themselves safe, but also to get access to those opportunities. Excellent. Thanks. Leslie, how would you answer that question? Well, National PTA's actually vision and mission is to make every child's potential by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for children and help them become successful. So what we do is we look at making sure that all the families and students have the resources necessary to have a safe digital community to um, live in and play in. So what that means is that we really don't want parents to go in. I know all of you sitting here are going, well, I don't want my mother to, to sit there and tell me when I can and can't be on the screen. But what we really want to do is give you the resources that say, this is a great time, let's limit the screen time, let's make sure that our, our students are playing in a safe area, and that we work with corporate so sponsors by giving educational products that really give you the information that you need. Because being a mother, I've watched my daughter, my, well, I've got a grandson that's very ill, she gets the first thing she does, she gets on the internet, right? Is it the right information? It's, it's something that we have to be aware of. Are we finding the right information or not? Inf not? And so we're really, working hard to make sure that you and all your families are safe in that digital world. Excellent. So as an educator, I think the number one thing we need to do is to teach students how to protect themselves on the web. And so I believe that all kids everywhere in the United States should have a media literacy course. And um, thank you very much to all these companies for everything you're doing. But you know, there's a lot of stuff that slips through the cracks. And so for you guys to know how to protect yourself, 
that's the most important thing. And I think that um, it wouldn't be a lot, you know, it could be like a four week class that was embedded in one of the classes you already take. It would give you an opportunity to spend a lot of time online and to understand what the dangers are. So whatever we can do to help do that is what I would like to suggest. Excellent. Well, I'm going to do a follow-up question for each of you, and then I'm going to hand things over to you, Michaela. And actually, can I call you Watch? Is that OK? Let me start right there, because the point you just made, I think, was extremely important. First of all, um, and particularly for the viewers watching in, just what is media literacy, first of all, and why is it so important? So media literacy means understanding the difference, for example, between fact and opinion, understanding what fake news is and how people are doing it, mm -hmm. understanding what the role of the media is in the 21st century. We have to live with it. There's no way that you can go around banning kids' phones. You know, it's like banning cars in the early part of the 21st, 20th century. They're dangerous. And so the question is, should we all just ban cars so that we don't have to worry about people getting hurt? Or are we going to teach people how to drive safely? Well, it's the same thing, how to drive safely on the internet. And kids just need to know how. And I would just guess that there isn't anybody in this room who's had a media literacy course. If you've had a media literacy course, raise your hand. Not one person. Now, I would say that it would be pretty exciting if you could spend four weeks analyzing and understanding the web. And that's what I would like. For all sure. Kids, all kids to do. Yeah, because Can I we... just echo? Sorry. Yeah. Not just all kids. I think all adults as well. There's enough research to show that even as adults, we look at news and we don't have the correct tools to be able to discern what's really going on there. So I would love to piggyback off your four-week program and make it universal. Yes. And global. I think <laughs> all adults... Well, actually, if the kids could learn how, they could teach their parents. And maybe we could extend it to government leaders as well. Everybody. I think Everybody. That would be awesome. I didn't want to make it political, but what the heck. Um, Alicia, um, talk a little bit about how you guys are working across your different platforms, and specifically the idea of teens as role models uh, for this. So I think one thing to note is that you know Google is a huge place. It's like a city. Like it's so interesting for me coming in and just thinking there's so many different people working on all aspects of these products. So some place like Google Search, you know, really is like an index of the web, right? And so it's a conduit to finding websites, but like what is on those websites belongs to those, you know, those site owners. Whereas YouTube is what we call a hosted platform, right? Where people upload the content to YouTube and YouTube can kind of take a stronger stance on some of the content and the policies that are there. So there's a few different things that we're doing at YouTube where we you know, can really work with YouTube creators, for example. Um, we have a program called Creators for Change, which is around really kind of elevating some of those creators who are trying to you know, kind of unify and bring together and start kind of positive conversations around civic engagement, other kinds of issues. So that's one initiative. Um, I, I refer to Be Internet Awesome, which is really, you know, kind of focused on kids a little bit younger than you guys, but really kind of the idea there, I think, that we've talked about is, like, obviously young people in some ways, you guys are living and breathing and thinking about these issues all the time and have such a strong role to play in mentoring your siblings, in, in fact, in some cases, your parents, you know, and kind of getting them up to speed on the kind of debates and the discussions that you're seeing. And I know from talking with a lot of young people myself that I think you're thinking through these issues really critically in terms of, you know, what does it mean? So, for example, in Be Internet Awesome, we have a unit called Be, you know, Be Internet Kind. You know, what does it mean to be kind online? What kinds of um, things would you share on the internet that you wouldn't share in other kinds of contexts of your life? And really just providing a place to start those conversations um, and, and engage with people that way. Great. Just want to piggyback on that. It's also what to share and what not to share online. Oh, yeah. That is so important. And, you know, I always talk about your digital footprint in class. And you don't want to ever have a digital footprint that you're embarrassed by. So if you do something when you're 14 or 15 years old, you might want to think about how that's going to impact you when you're 25 years old trying to get a job. Yeah, um, when my youngest daughter was a freshman and uh, sophomore in high school, she was way out in terms of expressing herself, shall we say, particularly on Facebook. Um, by the time she got to be a junior and senior and was applying for college, a lot of stuff was coming down. So we, we see that trend quite a lot. 
Leslie, the national PTA has an extraordinary reach into communities around the country. What are you seeing and hearing around this issue? And particularly, what can we do to help parents better approach this issue with their kids? Well, one of the things that we've done is we've actually awarded over $750,000 in grants to make sure that these programs, such as Be Internet Awesome, are giving um, to parents and, and students and giving them a, a safe place. Because what we're hearing from parents is the digital world is huge, and a lot of us are not familiar with the rules that go into play. As you said, media li literacy is something that we need, and I think it's really a partnership of all of us sitting here, as well as nonprofit groups that come together and really work with parents to give them guidelines on how to help keep their children safe. While most of you sitting here today probably know what your guidelines should be, but we're also noticing that mental health has become a huge issue with digital safety. Screen time, how much time our children are on there, and it affects the way that they actually interact after they've been on the screen for a long time. I've seen it with my own children. So we have to be aware that the digital space is great and has great information, but it also can be dangerous for all of us sitting here today. And so that's really where we're going, is making sure that we're promoting those programs and grants, training parents and leaders. Um, we've got 54 state constituents that really work very hard with all of our members. And like I said, we also have students that are part of our membership that work just as hard to make sure that we're getting the world safer and advocating for things that are going to help our families succeed. Brilliant. Brilliant. Jeff, um, I came across some amazing videos that you guys have created. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? But also, what I would describe as user controls, not parental controls, that TikTok, I, I think they're state of the art. Do you want to talk about those? Thanks. Um, in listening to this, I, it, it makes me think that one of the ch problems we've seen in this world of online safety over the last few decades is that it's a lot about preaching um, and telling young people what to do. I think we've evolved a lot because all of us sitting up here understand that young people are smart and savvy and I guarantee that every single one of you in here could navigate the ecosystems of Snap, of Instagram, of TikTok way better than I can. I know my kids who are nine and 10, although they use the appropriate versions of each of these, they're much smarter than I am. So. The way I look at TikTok is we really try to lean into this and we try to recognize that all of you are incredibly smart and savvy and we try to empower you to create the environment on the TikTok platform that makes sense for you. Um, so we have a suite of tools and I think they're very um, popular and used a lot that will allow you to report things, block people, um, choose if you want to let someone duet with you or not. We have a whole host of these. Um, and then we have these really amazing TikTok style videos that are fun, creative, quirky. When I first saw these, I was kind of blown away and I thought, wow, we need more of these because I just wanted to keep watching them. And instead of showing users in kind of a boring way, like this is what you press to report someone, they kind of bring it alive using influencers and creators. Um, and so we're continuing to do this. It's been very popular. We're going to be doing one on media literacy soon. We're very excited about that. Um, and, and so again, this kind of just reflects our approach of really trying to empower all of you to use um, your knowledge and your, um, your desire to create the experience that you want. Well, you, you even have a control that a user can put in, a kid can put in, saying, I only want to watch 15 minutes of these. Because, I mean, they're so compelling, you know, yeah. you can just keep going. That's right, and, we, and, and this brings up a whole other issue that we were chatting about, um, the whole issue of screen time. I mean, this is something that affects all of us. I mean, the fact of the matter is phones have changed our brains in ways that experts, you know, 10 minutes away from here at Stanford are just beginning to appreciate now. Um, but I think those of us at companies you know, we recognize this. And so at TikTok, we do have tools to limit screen time and have one of these great videos that shows you how to do it. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And, and again, it's, it's geared more for teens and young adults, I feel, than, than directly to parents. I just thought it was really interesting. Karina, do you have anything else you want to add before I had hand no, over? Absolutely. I think there's some 
incredible ways that technology is being used to empower all of us to make the right choices. So I love these a couple of things that Instagram has rolled out in the recent few weeks. So one of them is when you're typing something below someone's photograph, yeah. and you sometimes don't realize that this isn't like you know face-to-face -face communication, where you're giving so many other cues to the other person so the person can read your face and say, are you joking or are you actually being serious? And so when you're typing something, which you may intend for it to be funny, but because that's, you know, you aren't face to face with the other person, it may actually be hurtful to the other person. So this will prompt you using the power of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and tell you, hey, something that you're typing may actually not be um, kind to the other person. Do you want to rethink how you're writing? And you know, you get that prompt which really gives, allows you to take a step back and say, you're right, like, you know, the other person can't see my face and that's not how, what I'm trying to say here. And you can write something else there. So I think that's a really great use of technology to help us take a moment, stop, take a deep breath, and think, is this you know, going to be read the same way that I'm intending for it to be read? Um, and then the other one which we launched recently was something which you know, we hear all the time from young people that they feel a lot of pressure when they are on our platforms to get a lot of things like likes, engagement, like you know, how many people have liked my photograph? So one of the things that Instagram tried out was making sure that only you can see your likes, not your friends, not other people who you're connected with on our platform. Because it's important for you, you know, to see who's engaging, like, am I reaching my friends? But it's not really important for the world to put the pressure on you and tell you that, you know, X number of likes means you're popular. So just, you know, taking away some of that pressure was the goal of the exercise. And again, you know, I think these are kind of things which we are trying out on our side to make these platforms more kinder and, you know, give you more control over what you're doing on our platforms. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. All right, Michaela, I want to hand things over to you. I know you have some pretty interesting questions for these guys. Okay, actually, I kind of want to start with the, uh, the questions from the people here. So, uh, Kim P asks, what is the responsibility of the tech industry uh, to safeguard and or filter information to the voting populace, especially during elections? Like, obviously, there's been some controversy of this with Facebook, and I want to know what the, uh, and everyone here would like to know, like, what the other platforms can do about that, too. Do you want me to take it first? Okay. So, um, I, you know, everyone's been reading the news. This is something which is widely being debated right now, that what should be the role of our platforms when it comes to political speech? Uh, and both sides of the you know, spectrum, there are very heated views on this and very strong views on this. The way that we think about this at Facebook is we really do not think that we should be, you know, stopping political speech because we think that our platforms are very important places for uh, people who hold public office to be accountable to citizens and for citizens to engage directly with people who they've elected or who are standing for elections to ask them some really hard questions. But we do want to make sure that our platform is not being misused to spread misinformation or what some people call fake news. So the way that we've been going about it is that we've been taking a three-pronged approach. First, we will remove any content that violates our community standards. So that's the first thing we want to do. We want to make sure that if you are posting something which is against our community guidelines, it will be taken down. Second, we want to reduce content that has been previously fact-checked. So we work with fact-checkers around the world to flag any piece of information which is disputed. So that you know when you're looking at that piece of information that, you know what, this isn't a proven fact. There is actually a debate going on about this, uh, something that someone's saying. And then the third piece of it is uh, informing you all. So every time you look at that post, you should be able to see a flag or something that tells you this isn't a proven fact, this is actually being disputed by accredited third party fact checkers out there. But also we're making very deep investments in a lot of media literacy programs. So one of my favorite things that I got to work on last year was I worked with the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. They've created some amazing, uh, you know, easy to download and use lessons in classroom settings with, to get young people together to really look at news and be able to determine what are the filters that we need to use when we are looking at information to determine if it is really a fact or if it's something which you know we need to take with a pinch of salt? So that's the strategy we are using. We want to make sure that we are removing content that violates our policies. We are reducing distribution of content that is being disputed. And we are also informing people when they are looking at information on our platform that there are other views out there. So showing related articles or indicating that this article has been fact-checked and it's not really a fact. 
Um, I think a lot of a lot of overlapping work, obviously around re you know removing content that violates our policies, reducing the spread of harmful misinformation and, and um, content which may be sort of intentionally misleading folks. I think the one thing that I'd add from a YouTube perspective is what we're working on in terms of raising authoritative content. So that is, um, you know, content that we, you know, has sort of has kind of rigorous standards and when you search for information, we want to make sure that that authoritative content is the kind of the first stuff that you see at the top of what you see. And obviously people will continue to kind of do their research and and investigate further, but we really want to make sure that for you know most people who are new to issues, that that authoritative content is kind of what they see. So on YouTube, you'll see um, you know some changes in terms of how you see content within the recommendations that you get when you search for information in terms of what is recommended in your Watch Next panel. So. For example, we took some steps to reduce the spread of what we called kind of borderline content. So that's content that doesn't violate our policies, but it swims, you know, kind of right up close to the line. And so, you know, we do believe that there's a kind of a place for all kinds of opinions and voices, but we don't want to necessarily be kind of recommending that content. So we've taken some steps to kind of reduce the discoverability of that. And then on Google search, we have knowledge panels, which are kind of info panels that you get against kind of key searches in collaboration with the Google News Initiative to again kind of make sure that we're kind of raising some of those elevated, uh, sorry, authoritative um, sources right up to the top so you're getting that kind of robust information that you need. I'll just describe what we're doing at TikTok. So um, we think of ourselves as a positive place where we want creativity to thrive. Uh, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. We have banned political ads. Um, we really want to uh, I keep using this phrase, but really lean into um, what our platform is and what we want it to be, and that's a fun, positive place. That doesn't mean that some of these challenging issues are all of a sudden gone. There's always going to be challenges as um, bad actors are coming up with new ways to spread misinformation or deep fakes is something that's been mentioned that we're all working on. Um, so we have to focus on those as well. For me, I think that the, the, the thing that really gets to the root of it is media literacy, um, because we are never gonna take away some of these negative things. And the only real way to address the root of the problem is to empower all of you and all of our users at any age, including adults, to understand how to think about media literacy and be able to decipher what's real, what's fake, what is misinformation, and what's not. Cool. Michaela, is that good? Okay, your next question. Oh, did you guys want to respond? Well, it was more of a technology industry, but I will say I'll piggyback off of what Jeff said was that it is, it is about education. and It's about educating not only the students, but also the parents and, and the family and the communities around them. That's going to be really important mm -hmm. in the future. So I'll just reiterate, media literacy. That's the <laughs> way to change. <laughs> Media um, literacy. Go ahead. We have another question here that's anonymous. Uh, with people, it's kind of related to with people being encouraged to express themselves online. What do you think would be the future of censorship? The future of censorship, folks. Easy. Come on. <laughs> Who wants to start that one? I'll take a stab. Thank you. <laughs> Wait. Um, so I think you know we are global platforms and we operate in all kinds of different um, political contexts around the world, right? And in different political contexts around the world, there are sometimes different values around um, whose speech is allowed in public and how to um, both kind of help people express themselves, but in certain contexts, there's real limitations on what and how people can say. So, you know, we have tried to take a kind of a global view to these questions and try to create policies that will work in a number of different contexts. There are some parts of the world where certain kinds of speech is actually illegal, right? And so, and certain kinds of content is illegal. So we do have to kind of make sure that we're complying with local laws at the same time as kind of have values where our platforms are a place for people to come together to express themselves and you know, to always kind of have that sort of freedom of expression opportunities there. So I don't think I know the answer to this question because I think it's a really tough one that we're all really grappling with, which is what is the right balance between you know, taking a stance against content that violates our policies, that may be harmful, that may be dangerous in some ways, and you know, wanting to remove content when that exists, but at the same time not, um, you know, picking and choosing kind of who gets to speak and who 
is allowed to kind of have a voice in public. So I think this is a really, like kind of one of the crucial questions for our time. And I can say that we're actively, you know, grappling with it, but I don't think I have a great answer. Yeah, I would, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I would just say um, something brief to really just follow up on that. Um, I think the most important thing is for companies to have clear values and then stick with those. And the reason is because there aren't right answers to some of these questions. Is it censorship if you take down horrific content that's you know, bloody and disturbing? You know, some people might think that should be up everywhere, but the reality is we're not governments and you know, we need to decide based on our values what should and shouldn't be on our platforms. Um, and so I, I think having worked at a number of different companies, what I've come to believe is the most important thing is to have clear company values and to really stick by those and those will guide you in making some of these challenging decisions. Hmm. You know, I just want to add two things here. I think one of the things we learned last year was that this is a lot of power even in our hands. So we need to make sure that we are giving people a way to appeal some of these decisions that we're taking. Because sometimes we make mistakes as well. We deal with billions and billions of pieces of content and we don't always get it right. So giving people a mechanism to reach out so that it's not, it doesn't really feel like censorship and they have a way for redressal is really important. Uh, and then the second piece of it is, um, you know, we all as companies have government reports that we publish because we want to be very clear and transparent around how many requests we are re getting to take down some of this content. Where are those requests coming from? What was the nature of those uh, you know, requests. So we should be very transparent around the requests that we are getting from governments, but also around some of the decisions that we are taking because they violate our community standards. So we have a community standards enforcement report that really publishes how much content are we taking down under each of our areas of harm. We've just started, so we are not very comprehensive right now. We just have a few areas of harm. How much of it are we taking down based on reports that we are receiving from people, and how much of it are we proactively detecting? So I think two things are really important important to you know get ahead of you know this fear one of them is giving people a m way to appeal and you know get some redressal and number two transparency transparency around how many of these pieces of content are we taking down on government requests versus on user reports versus proactively because they're violating our community standards can I just add one last thing? Um, most of you will probably know that you can also report content yourselves. Um, I know you can on YouTube, I'm sure you can on Facebook, I'm sure you can on TikTok. So I, when I talk to young people, sometimes people think, oh, I'd never report anything because it won't go anywhere and no one's really paying any attention. I want to just remind everyone that's actually not true, that, you, that you, when you report content, it does get reviewed. It doesn't necessarily get taken down, it will get assessed, but I um, actually really encourage everyone to use that tool. And you can see, we have a kind of a video called The Life of a Flag like what happens you know, when you flag content and how the process works. So just to kind of remind everyone actually, you do have a say in that process and you can you know, report content for violating policies and you know, in some cases it will get taken down, in some cases maybe not, but just to encourage you to use that tool. And I think I'd like to piggyback on what all they've said is, is that it's important that you understand the power of your voice. These individuals are corporate individuals that are listening to all of you about what, what is necessary and what isn't in the new digital community that we're creating. So you have to remember that you do have a voice and they are listening to all of you. So when you see something going that is not, not true and you know it's not factual, then make sure that you report it because the power is in our hands to help guide the future of where we're going. We don't want to be censored. We are in a democratic society. So that's something that we've been founded on. Our association was founded by two women in 1897 that did not have the power to vote nor the power to speak, but they did. And because of that, we've lived in our thriving association that's over 100 years advocating for all of you sitting here today. So just know you do have that power. Take, take possession of it and help all of us succeed for the future. Here, here. And I just want to follow up with uh, what both of you were saying. If later this evening when you've gone home, and you see a car accident outside, would you just ignore it? Or would you pick up the phone and call 911? Right, so there's lots of similarities with bad things that happen online. Make sure to report. That's your job as a citizen, as a digital citizen. I think we have a high school leaving, so we'll just uh, let them go. Okay, Michaela, what's your, what's your next question? Oh, okay, my next question is for TikTok. This one's from me. Uh, so we talked about how, like, you know, we have the freedom of speech or whatever. So um, last November, the U.S. government had opened a national security review of TikTok citing its connection with China. 
Do you think that TikTok's connection to China is something you should be worried about here in America, or is it completely separate from the China branch? Yeah, so what I would say on that is TikTok operates only outside of China, so we're everywhere but China, and we store all our, our information locally, meaning also outside of China, so in America, in America. Um, and so I think for that reason, I mean, I, I don't see it as any threat. And of course, I work there, and I'm super excited about what we're doing, and I'm really um, enthusiastic about the cross-cultural collaboration with um, people that I'm working with from all over the world, including China. Okay, uh, so here's another student one, and it's kind of related to like the nuances of censoring and stuff like that. How are you determining the boundary between creative expression with body image and the lewd expression, especially if it pertains to the wide range of users? So creative expression, but also with lewd like, expressions of body yeah, image? Yeah, with like the body image. Are you guys familiar with what happened with Tumblr? <laughs> How do you strike that balance? You yeah. know, what, what I would say is we are corporate um, entities and we need to be humble and realize that we don't know all and we're not experts. And so what we do, and I know that every company does this and I've done this for a long time, um, the way we're going to be successful is turning to outside experts, whether it's FOSI or Connect Safely or Thorn in areas like this, um, or academics who have really been digging deep into where you draw these lines, what um, constitutes harm. So we do a lot of that to try to learn um, what we should do. So I would just start with that as something I think is important to approach this. You know, and I can chime in. Um, you can make out from my accent, I'm Indian. I lived in India for a really long time. If I went out into, in my country today, in most parts of my country dressed, even as I am right now, you'd get a loud outcry that I'm not being very, uh, you know, I'm not being a good girl, okay, is what I'd be told. The norms around what is acceptable, what's not acceptable when it comes to um, expression of your body vary so much depending on which part of the world you're in. And, you know, we as global companies have a really, really tough challenge here. So when I go to my you know, colleagues in the Nordics, they always tell me, you're a prude, all of this is self-expression, this is not nudity, keep it up, why are you taking it down? And when you go towards the more, like, you know, conservative markets, and that's a really terrible term to use for that, uh, you'll be told you need to cover up more. You've got a lot of nudity. We're getting into a lot of heat with our governments. So, you know, one of the things we did as when I, you know, joined Facebook many, many years back is we did a lot of listening to us. So as Jeff said, we went out into the field and we really heard from people on where they think that these lines should be drawn. And these are conversations we continue to have. And we continue to shift the uh, policies based on what's going on in the world around us as well. So a few years back, we had a really strict policy, no nudity allowed on Facebook at all. And then I got a lot of pushback from women's rights groups who were like, you do know that you're perpetuating patriarchal norms. It's okay for a man to have a bare upper torso, but it's not okay for a woman to show her bare upper torso. Like, you were supposed to be the, you know, opening up of our worlds and, you know. So, what we did was, we heard from a lot of people and we shifted some of our policies. So, we now allow photographs on Facebook of mothers feeding their children. We did not allow that many years back and that was wrong on us. We allow people to show, you know, nudity sometimes in the context of protest. In some parts of India, when women want to push back against some very autocratic regimes, they actually take to the streets saying, yes, I'm shameless. You know what? I'm going to be nude here and I'm going to protest your policies. So we do want to allow those important conversations on our platform. So we will allow in those limited contexts nudity to be shared, but we will not in other contexts. But what you're talking about then is the next level of conversation. Like, who are we to decide? How much nudity is enough nudity, right? Like, or, you know, this is a really complicated discussion which we continue to have with experts to draw the line better, make sure that we are, you know, allowing that space for expression, for creativity, but at the same time that we are not also allowing content which may actually, you know, be considered inappropriate by many other people who use our platforms. Uh, it's a really, really tough one. Lots of sleepless nights on that one. All right. We only have a few minutes left, Michaela, so if you don't mind, I think it's good if we go to the audience, uh, first of all, just to make sure, any of you guys have a question that's right in your mind here? You've got Facebook, Google, and TikTok, not to mention the national PTA and the world's leading media literacy expert. Any questions from the audience at this point? Okay. Michaela, what's, what's your take? Probably one last question. I have, uh, my last question is, what does internet safety mean to you? And also, keep it short. Oh, 
was Did you hear that? <laughs> keep it short. Keep it short. Okay. I'll keep it short. <laughs> I think media li literacy for our association is about educating families and students about how to create a safe digital world. And mental health has become very prominent for all of us in, in making sure that we're healthy and wise and really exploring the new world around us. But the question was online safety, right, Michaela? Online safety? What well, does it mean for to us, you? it's educating. It's actually getting out. We're the boots on the ground that you'll see us on your campuses. We are the the moms, the dads, your community members that come in and actually educate your families, teachers, and um, the community around you about what that means as we partner with these important co corporate and non-profit um, partnerships. So we are those people that are there within your school communities really promoting the programs needed. Okay. Ditto. I say the same thing, and since we don't have a lot of time, I give everybody else a little bit of time, but I believe echo what you said. So I think internet safety means a couple things. One, it means um, you know, matching, your, matching the content that you get to your expectations. So if you're searching for a term um, you know, that could mean a lot of different things that you're not going to get kind of shocking or um, explicit results you know, automatically for a search term that you haven't kind of declared your intention. Secondly, it's around creating kind of healthy habits and context. So digital well-being, you know, we have a number of different tools. On YouTube, you can set, um, take a break reminders. You can, um, you know, create, the, there's loads of digital well-being tools within Android, for example. Like, you can flip your phone down and it will help you focus, you know, if you need to kind of study or, you know, not get distracted. Uh, Family Link has all kinds of tools that families can use together to, like, enable certain apps if you want, um, you know, to watch something together or do homework and not if you want to, if you want to kind of limit your distractions, and then finally, you know, thinking about um, you know safety to do what safety to to create to participate, and that requires you know kind of protecting um, young people from unwanted contact um, from strangers from from thinking about you know the content that they see. So it's really kind of all those different pieces I think would fall under safety, and I'm I'm really interested not just thinking about what we can kind of keep away, but also what we can offer you in the time that you spend online. When I think of online safety, I, kind of, I go back to this idea that we have to think about the whole ecosystem. So at TikTok, um, we, we look at this in terms of the five Ps, which is policies, people, product, partners. Um, I have notes here, uh, <laughs> practices. But um, these all mean something to us, and it just means you can't do one thing. You can't just have community guidelines. You can't just have tools to report. So we have to really think of this holistically internally. And then if we look outside of a company, um, it's all about us working together um, with government actors, with civil society, with young people, um, and with experts. Because this, going back to one of the comments, this is something that is not set. It's like one interpretation of our constitution, which is it's a living document. This is uh, something that is always changing, and we're going to have to work together, and there's not one solution. And when I joined Facebook, um, I remember this one uh, thing that I read, which was putting people at the center of the web. It's about making sure that people have the ability to enjoy the benefits that the internet can provide us. It's changed our world in many, many positive ways. We tend to forget that some days. But also then giving people the control over who they're connecting with, what they're sharing, what they're not just sharing amongst friends, but also with us as technology platforms, and giving them the controls to really decide what they want to define that experience for themselves. That, for me, is internet safety. And Michaela, if I can turn the question on you, what does online safety mean to you? Uh, I guess like as a student and like as a child, online safety means that I should be able to browse whatever I want, whenever I want, but like with certain regulations to like upkeep my mental health that I hope that I can bring upon myself as my responsibility to upkeep it. Here, here. Well, thank you so much for the uh, co-moderation, and can you all please thank this great panel here.